Fade Out, a Day Brandstetter Mystery, Book 1, Author, Joseph Hansen, Publisher, University of Wisconsin Press, Terrace Books, 1970, Narrator, Eric Ost. Chapter 7. He even slept. Knocking woke him. He still sat propped against thin pillows and a hard headboard. His neck and shoulders ached. The scripts had slid off his knees. Now, when he straightened his stiff legs, under the thin machine-made Indian-style blankets, the script slithered to the floor. The lamp glowed sickly in the daylight. Wincing, he switched it off, and the glass that wasn't glass, the dregs of whiskey lurked like a neglected friendship. He made a sound, cleared his throat, tried again. Who is it? Coffee, Mr. Branstetter. Good. He wanted that. He flapped into the bathrobe. Under his feet, the floor felt clammy. He opened the door. Beyond the heavy white arches, the rain-drenched leafage of the patio garden sparkled in sunlight. He squinted between him and the dazzle. A young Japanese smiled and held out a black tray painted with Mexican flowers and birds. On the tray steamed a painted pottery jug. There was a cup to match, a spoon, packets of sugar, and powdered cream. Dave didn't take the tray. He said, your name's Ito, isn't it? Yes, sir. Dave jerked his head. Come in. I want to talk to you. The boy came in and put the tray down on a coffee table that had patterned tiles set into its top. Dave shut the door. You worked for Fox Olson once, right? Dave's portable typewriter stood in its case on the floor by the coffee table. The boy looked at it, then at him. Are you a reporter? He asked. I can't tell you much. I only worked for him one day. I'm an insurance investigator. Dave picked up the crumpled cigarette pack from the bedside stand. He held it out. The boy shook his head. Dave set a cigarette in his own mouth. Last Christmas, was it? That's right. The boy took a matchbook from his white jacket and lit the cigarette. Quick and graceful. Mrs. Olson hired me as a surprise for him. Thanks, Dave bent and poured coffee from the jug. It smelled great. Was he surprised? Very, the boy grinned. He had beautiful teeth. He almost fell down. But he wasn't pleased. Look, if you get another cup... It's okay, Ito said. I've already had enough coffee to surf in. He had no Japanese accent, strictly California. He blinked thoughtfully. He seemed pleased. Mrs. Olson told me he was... That was Christmas Day. He raised his shoulders, held his hands out, palms up. Next morning, Bob, you're fired. No reasons given, Dave sat down on the edge of the bed. Blew at the coffee, sipped it. No reasons, Ito smiled. Just a very fat check. Not two weeks' wages, two months. Mrs. Olson said she was very sorry. She'd made a mistake. She thought Mr. Olson would want me working for him. He didn't. Whose check? His? The ashtray was full of butts. When he tapped ashes into it, Ito took it and emptied it into the frayed Indian basket by the dresser. Hers, he said, putting the ashtray back. She handled the money. I heard somebody talking about that Christmas day. What else happened that day? The boy shrugged. They had a lot of people in. It was a beautiful day, clear and sunny like this, only dry and warm. I was real happy. I mean, it's a nice house. Beautiful surroundings. The kitchen was perfect. That's what bugged me worst. I never got a chance to cook a real meal there. You like to cook? Dave asked. You don't cook here? No, but it's a good job. I'm saving my chips when I get enough. I'll open my own restaurant. The Olsons paid you well. Better than any job I ever had. And I like them. Especially him. He was somebody else. Man always like if it's convenient and don't go to any extra trouble and when you have time and aren't you getting tired would you like a break i can look after things always jumping up to help me whenever i came in sight with a tray they were mostly out in the garden and around the pool even if he was singing or something he'd take time to ask me if i was okay did i need anything great guy except he fired you Dave said. Hito laughed. Yeah, and they talk about inscrutable orientals. No incident with him. Arguments? Criticism? No, the boy frowned. Unless... I don't know whether you'd call it an incident exactly. 
But after I got everything cleared up that night, real late, I was getting ready to sack out. I just had a shower. He knocked at my door and called my name and I said, come in. It was probably 2.30, 3 by now. It's been a long day and he was kind of stoned. He opened the door and for a minute, he just stood there staring at me. I was drying myself off and he said, excuse me, and started to back out. I asked if there was anything more I could do for him. He looked kind of funny for a minute. He didn't answer, just stared with his mouth half open. Then finally he gave a smile like maybe he was feeling sick or something. He said, no thanks, Ito. It was a very nice Christmas. And he turned and bumped into the door and mumbled, thanks for all you did or something like that. And he was gone. The boy knelt, picked up the scattered scripts. That was the last time we ever talked. It's a small town, Dave said. You must have run into each other now and then. No, I don't move in the country club set. My speed is the movies and the bowling alley. Ito tamped the edges of the scripts on the dresser top and laid them in a neat stack. If I was going to see him, it would almost have to be here. It was. Only a couple of weeks ago, he drove in in that white T-bird of his to see a guest. A guy from France. I was raking the garden. Mr. Olson passed me. He nodded and smiled. That was all. Ito frowned and sighed. Just the same, I'm sorry he's dead. He was the nicest guy I ever expect to meet. In the sunlit Daffodil Cafe, while Dave ate scrambled eggs and fresh country sausage, the little yellow plastic radio played Fox Olsen again, telling one of his stories. This time, a lot was missing. When you read them to yourself, the book would be funny, but a better idea would have been to put the stories on disc. Olsen's easy, dry delivery gave them what would word did you want? Droolness? That print never could? On the stools along the counter at the tables in the booths, truck drivers, shopkeepers, ranch and vineyard hands grinned and chuckled and guffawed, forgetting the good coffee, the bacon and buckwheat cakes, the buttery breakfast rolls growing cold in front of them. The story was about Auntie Minnie Husk, who, when the cottonwood corner's water tower was toppled by beavers, who'd mistaken the props for saplings, used the tank as a mold in which to bake the world's biggest cupcake, and how the resulting invasion of the town by millions of mice had been solved by the providential arrival of owls, who gorged themselves till they were too heavy to fly. They could only sit on the ground and belch. David read it and laughed at it last night. He laughed now, all over again. Next to him sat a pair of high school girls, cokes in front of them, books in their laps, one was pretty and dark and wore braces on her teeth. The other was red-haired, freckled and fat. Pinned to each of their blouses with a big orange and blue campaign button. Olson for mayor. When the story ended and a cigarette commercial twanged and everybody began eating again, Dave nodded at the buttons. Isn't it a little late for that? The pretty one gave him a cold look. No, everyone in school's wearing them. We loved them. Anyway, the freckled one said, we don't think he's dead. Dave nearly choked on his coffee. You don't? Why not? The pretty one said dramatically, because his body was never found. Only his car. So I heard, Dave lit a cigarette. The tiny counter ashtray was yellow plastic. It looked flammable. He shook the match out carefully. But if he's not dead, what happened to him? The freckled girl was poking a pair of bent paper straws among the melting ice chips in the bottom of her glass, noisily sucking up the last drops of sweetness. She stopped that for a second to say, He was kidnapped. You're kidding. By whom? What for? Mayor Chalmers, of course. The pretty girl was disgusted to have to explain anything so obvious. Tell the election's over. Come on, Luann, the fat girl got off her stool. If I'm late again, my mom will confiscate my tapes. Picking up her books, Luann told Dave, Doreen's got every Fox Olsen broadcast. Tell school started, Doreen made the correction over her shoulder, hurrying toward the daffodil screen door. There was a lot of her. 
all of it jiggled. The street was as dry now as if it had never rained. By afternoon, it would be dusty. Cars parked on the bias in Pima. He nosed his to the high curb between a pair of identical mud-crusted pickup trucks piled with empty orange crates. The building he faced was old red brick, two stories on the downstairs windows, peeling gilt lettering read Pima Valley Sun. When he was on the sidewalk, he saw through the windows that the paint inside was time-darkened, the desks and woodwork nicked. The morning was already warm and the front door stood open and sounds came out. Jangle of telephones, stammer of two-finger typing, chitter of linotypes. He passed. He wanted the other door, the one with the KPIM logo on it. He went in and climbed straight stairs into air-conditioned silence. The place smelled of newness and success. It glowed with clean light from fluorescent tubes, masked by frosted glass. Underfoot, the blue-green speckled carpeting was deep. The white walls and ceiling were cushiony with thick, fibrous plaster. Long rectangles of double-plate glass looked into studios and control rooms where equipment glinted. Records turned, shirt-sleeved men laughed without sound. Down the hall, somebody used a door, thick and heavy. It sighed, closing. Inhale McNeil's office floor to ceiling, drapes, crisp blue and green stripes shut out the view of ugly Main Street. The furniture was burnished steel and saddle leather on the white wall hung a big Peter Hurd painting. McNeil wore buckskin colored corduroy on his big frame, pockets, leather edged, modified cowboy style. Expensive. His face was tanned and rugged, his dark hair handsomely gray at the temples. Dark brows and lashes made his blue eyes startling. The eyes mocked Dave. Thorn tells me you don't think Fox is dead. Dave gave a small amused trudge. Neither does the student body of Pima High. None of them at your house? Grown and gone, McNeil said. But I suppose at that age he'd have worn the full button probably tacked the poster up in his room, too. Which, of course, his mother would have loved. McNeil's face hardened. His mother and I were divorced when Tad was 15 months old. The reason, she was a drunk and a tramp. Prettiest girl in the graduating class of Pima High School. June 1939. His mouth twisted. A drunk and a tramp. Who raised the boy? You, by yourself? My folks. They did their best, so did I, but there's an old saying, wash a dog, comb a dog, steal a dog. I don't know what's become of him. Don't care. But you do know about Mayor Chalmers' kidnap plot. All. And now you come along with something even wilder. Fox cracked up his car to make it look as if he'd been killed and walked away from everything. Why? I keep asking. Dave said. Somebody will tell me. I hope so. Nothing would please me more than to have him back here. McNeil glanced at his watch, pushed a button on his desk. Music came into the room. Fox Olson's voice, another harmless, tuneful mel mel melody. Clever little western, probably Olson's own McNeil, let it play itself out. Then, when an announcer began talking, switched off the speaker. I can use all of that. I can get. You'd know why, what I mean if you'd seen this place a year ago, dingy. Like downstairs. I mean, we were broadcasting. We were making a profit, but why did you cancel it after the car crash? McNeil's eyes were steady on him. You know the answer to that. It was a matter of taste. But the li listeners didn't figure it that way. As far as they were concerned, it was all a dark plot. McNeil laughed soundlessly and shook his head. Funny as hell, you know. I mean, the old ladies hollering about a Fox Olsen blackout on KPIM. The kids with their cheap TV-inspired kidnap plot, and now you. I mean, if you'd known Fox. He was open and candid as a child. He had no more dark side to him than, than the sun. What about Mayor Chalmers? Dave wondered. Does he have a dark side? Lloyd? McNeil threw back his head and laughed. 
It took him a minute to straighten his face. No, Mr. Branstetter, I'm afraid not. Lloyd's all shoulders. Ah! <laughs> he thrust out his jaw and made his voice gruff. Let's get the good damn job done. The type that built the West. Lloyd could no more connive than he could hook doilies anywhere. He never took foxes running against him seriously. I doubt if he even noticed. Did you take it seriously? Amused, McNeil gave a quick head shake. No, it was a gag to start with. Fox was rambling on one morning on the air about a mayoralty race in Cottonwood Corners. His imaginary small town, you know. Dave nodded. Mrs. Olson's lent me some scripts. Great, aren't they? McNeil asked it mechanically. Well, it gave me an ideal. Just a promotional ideal was all. Why not start a campaign over the station? Fox Olson for mayor and it got out of hand. Did you ever have a kite pull you right off the ground when you were a kid? Then you know the feeling, but he shrugged. We decided to go along with the gag. Fox went through the signing up routines and for the first time in the memory of a lot of the younger citizens of Pima, Lloyd Chalmers had somebody running against him for his office. His, believe me, he built half this town. Nobody's going to disabuse him of the idea that he owns it. Not soon. But he didn't take the campaign seriously. Ask him, McNeil said. He'll laugh at you. Was anyone going to vote for him? Olson, I mean? McNeil chuckled. Just everybody old enough. And then what? Did he want to be mayor of Pima? I think he did. McNeil narrowed his eyes, tugged his lower lip. Yes, I think he got to taking it kind of seriously after a while. But he shook his head, gave a crooked smile, and stood up. How could he? McNeil walked to a filing cabinet, pulled open a drawer brought out a fat manila folder. He laid it on the desk in front of Dave. Look at these. Expensive stationery, lavish, multicolored imprints. Dave turned over letter after letter. Radio would. Would Fox Olsen come and guest for a week with Arthur Godfrey on his morning show? Tell some of his hilarious stories. Sing a few songs. Television. Would Fox Olsen do a segment for Ed Sullivan? Would Fox Olsen consider dramatizing the Cottonwood Corner stories for a series? Would he star in them himself? Records. Would Fox Olsen record a dozen of his songs? Las Vegas. Would Fox Olsen appear twice nightly in the rodeo room? Concert management firms. Motion picture studios. Dave closed the folder and looked up. McNeil asked, Where would he get time to be mayor? Was he going to do all these things? Dave tapped the folder. Are you kidding? My Christ, man. Fox Olsen had been slaving a lifetime for success before he got this program. I'd swear he was a man ready to put a bullet through his head. He'd given up if it wasn't for his wife. McNeil broke off. Sorry, the answer is yes. He was going to do all these things. The record contract was already signed. With Dot, the rest of it was waiting till we could figure out a way to find time. See, Fox refused to do anything that would interfere with what he considered his obligation to me. KPIM came first. Hell, he hadn't even taken a vacation in a year and a half. I see, Dave said. Then what about the man from France? What kind of an offer was that? How? McNeil looked blank. Olson spoke to a man from France a couple of weeks ago. Somebody who'd come here to see him stayed at the Pima. Motor in. Olson talked to him there. He didn't say anything to you about it. Not that I remember. McNeil's phone rang and he reached for it. Excuse me. I'll go, Dave said and went. A Gay Mysteries Audiobooks I think it is easy to hate a label, but a face humanizes the word. So this effort is twofold. To offer comfort to those like myself that your world didn't end because you don't fit into the view of acceptable society on both sides. And in hopes of helping those with family that are LGBTQ, that it doesn't mean we are aliens from the child they once knew. Reassure them so they can maybe be supportive at the same time, being true to their values.